Right, time to answer a question I get asked a lot on here, and it's why do old gas masks use hoses and big filters? Or why do some modern masks still use that? What's the reason? You know, all sorts of questions relating to it. So I thought I'd take you through the history of it, and then we can, hopefully, you can understand a bit more why it was done, and why some masks will still use it, or similar systems. So, to begin with, we ought to start right at the beginning, so we'll go to World War One. And in this box I've got my replica that you've seen before, it's not the highest quality replica in the world, but the replica PH gas hood. So, here's the PH gas hood. And this is a mask made out of a sort of flannel material, and the idea was that it would be soaked in a kind of acidic chemical. It did have a name and I can never remember it. It was not piss as people keep saying. You'd soak it in that chemical, the soldiers would wear it when chlorine gas came it would neutralise the chlorine gas. Now, as far as I'm aware, the pH gas hood couldn't necessarily um, neutralise other chemicals other than chlorine, because it used, you know, one type of chemical soaked into the cloth to neutralise it, not an actual sort of proper filter. So Britain thought, we need an actual filter, um, you know, a filter unit, not relying on a mask soaked in a chemical. Uh, most of the Western powers had been using things like the pH gas hood or cotton wool soaked in some sort of chemical or the smoke helmets, you know, all things very similar to this. So an idea came up that, you know, everybody in each nation did their own sort of thing with it, but you need an actual filter unit. So what Britain did was develop something called the English box respirator. There was also later a collect corrected English box respirator. If you ever see the words EBR and World War One, that's normally what they're referring to. And that's one of the first proper gas masks. It's you know a mask with a big filter unit in a satchel, a hose running up to the mask, and you've got your gas mask. They're quite famous. If you search English box respirator, you'll be able to see one. I don't have one or a replica of one. But anyway, so obviously the thing was, if you had an actual filter unit, you could fill it with a lot of charcoal and particulate filters. The mask would be able to block more things from getting into the person's lungs who were wearing it. And obviously having a big filter would last longer because you could fill it with more filter medium um, as opposed to a small filter. Now Germany in World War I did have masks that actually had small filters on the masks and Germany since World War I would keep doing that. So the Germans were kind of ahead of the game. But the problem was in World War I and World War II the technology wasn't necessarily good enough <clears throat> in some ways if that makes sense of filters. Uh, bigger filters in some ways were an advantage because when you pack a filter, historically they were hand packed so people put the asbestos cloth in, they put the charcoal in, they you know sealed it up, taped it up or whatever. Um, and if you do that by hand in an environment where there's air and other stuff in the you know environment, I don't know if people were smoking when they put them together, the filters are going to kind of be partially expired by the time they get to you. So you know having a filter that's small is not a good idea. With the modern things, filters can all be made by machines, you know, in an air, in a vacuum almost, I guess, packed, <clears throat> you know, so they're like, and then sealed up properly. Old masks didn't really have the filters done to that scientific level when they were made, so a bigger filter was an advantage simply because it would last longer in the field, and because filters were never, like, brand new in a sense when they got to the soldiers on the front line, you would want a newer filter, uh, or a bigger filter rather than a smaller filter just simply because that gave you more time you know to use the filter in a contaminated environment okay so here we have a British Mark V general service respirator from World War II the old GSR um, and you can see that there's its big asbestos filter that I've taped up uh, but this would be asbestos in the bottom section of it and then the top section is all charcoal uh, some, I'm not sure it's the exact layout of the filter, but it would be a particular asbestos layer first, then the charcoal layer. Um, and it's connected via a hose. The reason is you can wear it on your satchel bag, and that obviously proves to be a massive, massive advantage. So if I can just, while I'm trying to juggle this, yeah, there we go. That sits in there, it's got a breathing hole in the bottom of the bag. You put the mask on, which I'm obviously not going to do, um, and then you could breathe in. This supports the weight, weight of the bulky filter. And when you've got the mask on, it also means it's not too bad for shouldering a rifle because the pipe's coming directly down, it's not coming from your shooting shoulder. So if you're left or right-handed, it doesn't matter because the thing is in the middle of the mask. It also means the mask itself is quite lightweight. You've got a bit of a hose there that can be a bit of a pain, but as long as the hose is long enough and the bag's supported at the right height, it's not really an issue. So 
Britain during World War II for the most part liked the hose design for the military gas masks with the big filter canisters, but they were realising at this stage that maybe they wanted to move away from that. However, some nations prior to World War II had already developed, you know, small filter masks. As I was saying, Germany was the main example of a nation that mostly used those type of masks, but I think France did quite a few masks with screw-on filters. You know, so Britain and America, although they liked the big filter design attached to pipes, lots of nations had already done away with that or were starting to do away with it. And again, it's a bit difficult to say, you know, were they ahead of the game? It's a bit like when you talk about small rifles and things like that, where some nations originally developed intermediate cartridges before other people and then moved away from them and moved back and all that sort of thing. Because often, you know, the theory changes at the time, so something that might be good today wouldn't necessarily be a good, good, good idea back then because of the technology changing and whatever else. But anyway, by the time you get to World War II, lots of masks used the big filters and hoses. Some of the nations were starting to go to the smaller screw-on filters than masks, or at least smaller filters that went directly onto the masks. Um, and as you go into the Cold War, America develops the M17 with cheek filters, bad idea. Britain uses the 60mm like anti-gas respirator before going to the 40mm S6. Lots of other nations do similar things with 40mm masks and whatever. But the Soviets are interesting because the Soviets uh, don't do that. So let's have a look at some Soviet stuff. Okay, so let's have a look at a mask from Communist Poland. I'm using this because I don't have a Russian SHM-41, but this is a very similar thing. So we're going to look at the OM-14 mask. <clears throat> so the mask you'll be very familiar with, everybody says it's a GP-5, is actually an SHM-41 style mask with the bigger intake and exhale valves. But what we also have in here is an EO-14 filter, very big. Remember, it's like the World War II ones, and a hose. So what the process was here was that basically you would open the filter up. Just try and get that in frame. Screw this hose in here. Then you could screw, I know it's just slightly out of frame, but bear with me because I've got the filter here. You'd um, screw the mask into there. Now the advantage to this system is because they're using 40mm Gost threads, they're actually able to do each sort of component individually. So you could issue smaller filters if you wanted to that would screw directly onto the mask, but you could also issue it with this thing. This is also a longer hose than they would use with um, the World War II masks for the most part, which is a great design. So, of course, the logic is the same thing. You'd have your filter bag that would be open, and inside you would pop your big filter in. So I'll just do that now. As I said, it's old commie stuff. It's probably got asbestos in or has got asbestos in, so I'm not going to use it. So anyway, you'd pop your filter in, you've got a hole in the bottom of the bag to breathe through as usual, you put the mask on, and then you've got, you know, this with a lot of reach, as you can see. Um, you know, you'd have no issue, if, especially if you're wearing this, like here as well, uh, with actual room to turn around. But you can t attach smaller filters directly to the mask. So, this was a great system for the Soviets, because it meant if they wanted to, with the majority of their masks, they could put a smaller sort of infantry sized filter on like the net Western countries were doing, the NATO countries, or you could alternatively use this setup. So, what is the advantage to this setup? Well, as I mentioned about the World War I filters and that, similar things, although the filter manufacturing is certainly getting better by this point, obviously having a big chunky sort of filter like you saw provides you with much more time in a contaminated environment because there's simply more charcoal and a bigger particulate filter you know, to suck everything up, um, block it from getting to your lungs. Whereas, if you're using a smaller filter on the bus, that's going to expire quickly and needs changing. So if you are only sort of issuing soldiers with one or two filters, issuing them with bigger filters that last longer is kind of the more sensible choice. But as I said, these masks, you know, you can adapt that way. So, what ends up happening is the EO14, sorry, um, EO14 is the filter, the, um, SHM-41 style masks end up being issued to, um, you know, most of the Warsaw Pact nation armies. The SHM-41 is later the mask they look at and say, oh look, we can make it cheaper and issue it to the civilians, that becomes the SHM-66U, or the GP-5 as it's known. GP-5 gets issued to everybody. So, they have a mask that all the soldiers are basically issued with, or variants of this, which can be attached either to a big filter canister or take smaller filters on the mask. Great design. 
because you can do either one that you want to. Um, but later the Soviets do start looking like with the PMG-1 to the idea that they actually want filters attached directly to the mask and to do the, you know, the more western thing. Um, so that's the route the Soviets ended up going down. Um, and now as far as I'm aware, all the modern Russian masks actually have filters just directly on the masks like the western countries do. I think Israel still uses some masks with the hoses, and I've seen videos and images of things when sometimes there's like industrial disasters and cleanups in countries where, although they've probably got the smaller filter issued masks, all the guys have hoses with the bigger filters on. I think that's simply just so the filter lasts longer in a contaminated environment. But there you go. That's most of your info on hoses on gas masks. Why was it used? Because it lets you have a much bigger filter that can filter more stuff, you know, and its weight is supported by the shoulder straps on the bag, so you don't really feel the weight of it. Um, you know, a smaller filter, yes, it's more convenient, but it doesn't last as long. With modern really good filters, that's not as an issue, because on modern masks, you'd normally have the filter on one of the cheeks, and the cheek that you don't shoot on. So, you know, you can have a lightweight filter that you can take on and off easily and that way. This system isn't as ideal, uh, for obvious reasons, but, you know, it's what they had and it works. Um, there's disadvantages and advantages to each, but as technology moves on, the filters get better and better. Smaller filters mounted to the mask make a lot more sense than using the big, bold, key sort of carry satchels to do it with. But there you go. Rather than having a carry satchel that just has the mask in that you pop the filter on, put on your head, you have a carry satchel that has all the parts that you need to assemble your mask and then carry, you know, bear the load of the filter and everything else. So that's why they used to use gas masks with hoses simply so it could be more convenient because you wouldn't want to attach a big ass filter like that directly to the mask. I'll just show you what that looks like. So yeah, you would not want a big filter like this attached directly to the mask. Uh, I'm not going to breathe through it because it's got asbestos and I've left the plug in anyway, but... That's almost going to break the airtight seal because of how much it, you know, bobs around and everything else. It's really stupid. So that's why. You'd have the filter on a hose because that way you can have a really big filter and the weight is carried on your sort of shoulders, around your chest, on your belt, rather than uh, having to, you know, actually have it on the mask directly. Better for the safety of the mask, makes a better seal and obviously gives you much longer protection time with a big chunky filter like this rather than the small sort of cheek filter type design. I forgot to mention this in the main part of the video, so I'll just quickly mention it now before I pack the camera away to render the video. Uh, but hoses with air sort of powered pumps are still used. The reason being that if you have filters attached to um, the air pump and then it's on a hose into the mask, it creates a positive pressure seal and means the person wearing the mask doesn't need to breathe as much. So that's useful if you're in a really contaminated environment and you're not actually using an oxygen tank. You have the filters being with air being pumped through the filters into the mask. You can just breathe normally and it creates a positive pressure seal. So, you know, no contaminants can get into the mask. So that's how it's sort of done nowadays, really, if you're going to have a filter attached to a hose. Unless it's just some nation that's bought uh, other nations old stock. But for the most part, you have a filter now directly on the mask somewhere or you have an air-powered pump pumping air into the mask through a sort of series of smaller filters on a hose, but there you go.